The village knee is probably the best worst character that Konosuba and Explosion on this wonderful world has in its roster. I say best worst because for entertainment value, easily the best. But in terms of personality, goddamn, I mean, they literally said he's destined to die alone. If that isn't the most ice cold thing you could tell the village knee, I don't know what is. But this was a pretty great episode. The second half was way stronger than the first. The first half, while fun, there's some good jokes, some subtle jokes, some in-your-face jokes. I mean, you do kick the episode off with Argo Megami slapping a chest around because she's a little upset about the different sizes. But at the end of the day, the second half of this episode is where all the comedy takes off. And now being a few episodes into the spin-off Konosuba anime, I have to say I'm liking what they're doing. The star attraction of this, which originally I thought would be just to see Megami's love for explosion magic in a village that is as chuny as it is, I thought that would be the main hook, but I'd actually say Union is probably my favorite aspect in terms of like more of a characterization aspect, seeing a character who I enjoyed in the main show but just really take off and excel because maybe it's just because I relate to the normalcy of just saying like there's so many logical ways to avoid this, but you guys are so chuny that if it doesn't look cool, then I'm considered the outcast. And I'm like, I just love what she offers. Add in the, the just the whole neat village neat who just honestly probably needs a restraining order or two. And yeah, you got a pretty damn good anime if you ask me. Now, I do have a full live reaction to this wonderful episode available on my Patreon, so if you do want to see my full uncut thoughts, you can head on over there and consider supporting. Like I said, I think the second half is far superior to the first, but the first does have some good gems. I love the almost background comedy of the teachers, so the teachers after last episode pretty much destroy the entire village, right? And the fact that yes, they do rebuild it in a day, it doesn't change the fact that they caused far more destruction than they stopped from happening. Like literally, if they would have just left those gargoyles to rummage around and do whatever they did, I kind of feel like there would have been less casualties and buildings destroyed than what they ended up doing with their own form of explosion magic, all things considered. This episode, pretty much the same thing happens. We just almost get background comedy with it. Teachers say, hey, it's more or less a study period. There's some crazy things going on in the forest. Bye bye By the end of the episode, they come back. Oh yeah, you probably want to walk home with someone because it looks like they're probably going to come to the village. It's like, th that sort of comedy is so good because... Based on how episode 2 ended, we saw what they caused in terms of a ruckus. We don't need to say, see the same thing, we can just assume this is an everyday or every other day occurrence for this village, but because they look cool, at least from everyone else's point of view other than, well, Union, because she's the normal one, it's pretty much just like, they might beat you around and say fix the village, but that's just, it's just a chuny village, like what else can you do? As much as I want to say at this point, it's no wonder Megami ended up the chuny that she is, Honestly, I think the correct phrase would be, it's actually a surprise that Megami turned out as normal as she did, given the influences around her at a school that is all about looking cool. And seriously, the comedy with Union just being like around the midway point, especially once we get into the village neat stuff. So they're trying to find a way to get him to be in contact with his crush, who he needs a restraining order. Teleportation magic only has three uses in terms of like picking destinations, one of which was the first spot he saw her, another is in front of her home. Like yeah, it's no wonder he gets basically pelted with very thick books because he's a bit of a creep. We got that from episode two, but it more so highlights it in this episode. So they basically have a game plan between the three of them and Union's like, listen, we could just get him, we could just get her to read his fortune. It's a very simple way to get them in contact. Nah, that doesn't look cool enough. So I'm gonna go invisible, I'm gonna crawl on the ground, you can have these x-ray specs and it ends about as well as you expect because it basically looks like he's trying to look up her skirt. The twist for me was actually that she doesn't think that he's a pervert, which he clearly is all things considered. It's more so she just thinks he hates her. Like, why are you always stalking me? Like, you're trying to hurt me. Doesn't help that after the one punch bears come in, she literally blows her up with him. But it's very, very funny for sure. And I'm glad that rather than just being like a one-off gag of like, hey, here's this pervert in a hole and we left him to rot. No, instead, we're going to have a lot of ridiculous shenanigans with him, especially given that the entire school has collectively agreed that he probably needs a restraining order or should be burned at the stake. And it's going to be fun, fun, fun. The one punch bears were wild, though, because the design of them was... I wasn't expecting it. It kind of looks like Teddy Ursa from Pokemon in terms of the head, but then the rest of the body is buff as if you took the roids in every direction other than the face, and man, the design was wild. The name, I mean, said One Punch Bears. I imagine if they actually did punch you, it would have been like One Punch Man, but they didn't even have the opportunity to really do anything other than damage to the forest, but it was pretty fun. 
that's why I say the second half is far superior. It's just like once you get into the village neat stuff and even just the whole like destined to die alone joke, it's just absolutely comedy gold. But the first half of it was fun, especially with just seeing once again the cat just continuing to have Megami's name and just the f the ferocity coming off of it and just it's a nice thing especially with the whole concept of like the little like bumblebee spider is kind of what it looked like basically Union's getting a little makeover from her new friend and because she just because Megami's trying to kill the spider all the hard work they did the first like friendship hairdo gets completely destroyed as Megami takes her hair bands and tries to hit the spider it's kind of crazy that honestly I say there's probably like a 10 to 30 percent chance that had Megami known explosion magic in that moment it's entirely possible she would have blew up the entire building just to get that spider and I don't honestly don't think that's an exaggeration. I don't think it's 50%, but I think there's a decent shot that she might have considered it and potentially started her chant had someone not beat her over the head. Right now, it's a good thing she can't use it, and basically, she isn't the landmine mage that she will end up becoming. But I honestly think it's kind of nice what they're doing with the potential relationship between the fortune teller and this neat. Now, how far it goes, who knows, but I love the fact that basically, like, hey, I'm gonna read your fortune, everyone has at least one person that will pop up in the crystal ball, but he didn't have anything. Like, the worst rejection you could possibly give someone, especially someone as socially awkward as this man, and it was pretty glorious. At this point, we have a pretty good idea of what this Konosuba spinoff wants to do. We have the characterization and bond between the frenemy, arch-nemesis, rival dynamic between Megami and Yoon-Yoon, we have a lot of the comedy direction and just, wow, this explains so much about why our Chuni explosion girl is the way she is when she's raised by these groups of lunatics. And also you have some new fun additions as well, like a village knee and the stalker love story that she's under the impression he just hates her, but... Really, it's just a very awkward obsession about love. I think there's a lot to enjoy. We've seen a good variety over these three episodes of what this show wants to do, and overall, I can safely say that this belongs in the Konosuba timeline. It's, do I think it's as good as the first couple of seasons? No. But does it do a different formula while still feeling Konosuba through and through, making it worthwhile to exist? Yes. And I think really that's all you can ask for. Some people might find this funnier, might find it better than the main show, and that's perfectly acceptable. But I think the vast majority of people will say this belongs in the Konosuba timeline. We can see why this can exist over another character getting a spin-off like Darkness or this, that, and the third. It just makes a lot of sense for this one to exist, and there's so many great characters to work off of as we wait for season three, which we know is in the pipeline. Thoughts and feelings yourself, a favorite joke if you got one. Honestly, the entire concept with the village neat, but definitely the destined to die alone joke was my personal favorite. But thoughts down below yourself. Leave a like if you enjoyed and subscribe if you're new around here. Also, be sure to ring that bell so you can get notified when I upload on the channel. And like I mentioned, we do have that full live reaction available on my Patreon if you're interested. While you're there, you can also get a video shout out. So today we have Jam, Jonathan Bromlow, and Zuda. So I appreciate the support, everyone. Please take care and have a good one.